Because Rabbeinu is saying, Ki bechol yad chamisha etzbaot. In every hand we have five fingers. Vehakaot haorot. And when we're clapping our hands, so we're hitting the lights one to the other. Yad yamin beyad smol. Right hand to the left hand. Rabbeinu calling our hands our lights. Hainu chamisha pe'amim chamisha. So it's five times five. Like that you do. Five times five means twenty-five. Normal value, twenty-five. Ve'akaot yad small beyad yamin chamisha pe'amim chamisha. Five times five. Gimatria gam ken esrim chamisha. So it's also twenty-five. So it's twice twenty-five. Shne pe'amim esrim vechamesh. Twice twenty-five. It's twenty-five here. And 25 here because it's five times five here and five times five is here. Gimatria Hamishim, so the normal value comes to 50, right? You're good at math. Zebechinot Hamishim Peamim Yetziat Mitzrayim Shinizkar Batora, and it's equal to the 50 times of Yetziat Mitzrayim, the fact that Akadosh Baruch took out Am Israel from Egypt, out of Egypt. 50 times it's written in the Torah. So those are 50 aspects of redemption. When you clap your hands, when you bring back the faith in front of your eyes, when you see that it's all Hashem, it's 50 kinds of redemption. And why? Because Mitzrayim, the word Mitzrayim means Mitzarim, narrow places. It's all kinds of exile. Egypt is teaching us on all kinds of exile. We were suffering in Egypt from all kinds of exiles that exist. So Egypt is teaching us about the exile. So the 50 aspects of faith, of clapping our hands together, are bringing the faith back into our awareness, means to remind ourselves that it's all Hashem, that it's not the bank, it's Hashem, that it's not the business, it's Hashem, that it's not the, the family, it's Hashem. To remind ourselves that, that it's all Koach Ma'asa V'gid Le'amot, that He's telling us that it's all His power, it's all His actions, those are 50 aspects of redemption. When you're going to see that it's all Hashem, then you've been redeemed already. Your Mashiach is already king. When you see Hashem in front of your eyes, you don't see people. Like my wife told me yesterday, she said two days ago, she said, no one can kill you. You cannot die. You just, and, and it's true. I don't know if you remember that, but I gave once a class. It was, it was amazing. I explained to you, Mamash, everything about it that when someone is rebuking you and, and even if he's coming with the knife into your body into, and, 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 and he's stabbing you into your, the most painful points of, of, your, of your soul, of your spirit and it's, it's, you, you're, you're about to be offended, you're about to be hurt if you remember that it's a rebuke now if you're not automatically being offended and you just look and observe on it, so you don't feel the pain. That stabbing doesn't cause you no injury, no pain. So just what happens? What that happens is that you recognize the points that you need to take care of, that you need to fix. By that stabbing, you realize exactly what Hashem Yidwach was telling you. So actually, all of that rebuke is an amazing lesson. It's just opening your eyes to recognize your defects, your defaults, your weaknesses, things that you need to take care of, things that you need to make sure to fix. And this is actually why Hashem Yitbarach done that. The insultings, the sorrow, the stress, the bad feeling that a person feels out of those rebukes are coming from a different place. It's not because of the rebuke. It's because of your will not to be rebuked, not to deal with your lackings. This is why you suffer. You don't suffer because you've been rebuked. You suffer because you don't want to be rebuked. You suffer because you rather not to learn. This is why you suffer. All of the suffering is because you don't want to know. Because you don't want to learn. 
Because you don't want to be educated, because you don't want to take responsibility. But if you will want to learn, so you're going to be you're going to love the rebuke, and you're going to be able to learn the Torah, to understand the message, and you're just going to grow. And then you're invincible. No one can win you, no one can conquer it, no one can beat you. Because even when David Amelech now being rebuked, being insulted, being hurt, by Shimi ben Gera, and he slaughtered him alive. He cursed him. He told him the worst things in the world, and he was a huge Talmid Chacham, Shimi ben Gera. It's not. We're not talking about some Amaretz that is cursing you in the street. Shabbos morning, we went to the mikveh. I'm taking two of my children. We're going in the mikveh to the mikveh. We're walking in the Rechov Saad Yagaon toward the Shari Chesed mikveh. We're walking. On our way back, so Shari Chesed. Sunday, a Haredi person. We see him talking to himself, walking in the street, talking to himself, white hair, walking, talking, talking, walking. And he sees us, recognizing his, his prey, coming toward us, coming to us. He's coming, start talking. Yeah, when he started talking in Yiddish. Uh, Hashem, I don't know how to talk Yiddish. One of the tzaddikim said, it's better not to learn Yiddish. Because then you cannot understand the tons of Lashon Ara that they're talking about you in the mikveh. So it's good not to know Yiddish. You're happy, you don't understand. Oh, the, okay, people talk in the mikveh, it's not rare. That you can see everywhere. You don't know talking about you, so everything is cool. You can enjoy the mikveh. So he starts to talk to me in English, in Yiddish. Uh, I'm not answering, so Baruch Hashem looking at him with a smile. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. And then he starts to move, oh, oh you're a Baal Tshuva, and then I saw like I, I lost my case already with him because I was a Baal Tshuva, but the person was insane, wasn't normal at all, and he's jumping from one subject to the other, and he, he's looking at my son wearing his Bar Mitzvah jacket, and he tells me why he needs to wear a Bar Mitzvah jacket, you can sell it, and you can give the money to the poor, and move on, and is he putting Rabbeinu Tam, I told him, yes, he's putting, no, there's no obligation to put Rabbeinu Tam, you can sell the Rabbeinu, okay, so he wanted the money, okay, I got it all. So it was, he wanted to sell the Rabbeinu Tam also. Okay, great, Shabbat, Shalom, can I go now? He wasn't ready that I'm going to go, but I had to because it, it was too long. And we told him Shabbat Shalom, and then he looked at me and he said, you're a breast level chassid, been executed. I told him yes. So he said, Imach Shem Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, Imach Shimcha, Imach Shem Amishpacha Shelcha, Imach Shem Eladim Shelcha. He cursed everyone he could. He didn't left one alive. I felt, so, I was so happy. I looked at my children, I told them, now I know that we achieved something this Shabbos. With a huge smile, we went home. I felt so relieved. He took all of my avonot all of my sins, and he just, he was so kind to take everything from me. He said, I can see, you're a Baal Tshuva, how much you sinned, and you're at Avonotcha, I can see your sins, he's cursing and cursing. And I felt so relieved, thank God, Hashem, you cleaned me. You took all of my mess, all of my filth, all of the, 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 the thick bloods, everything, you just took it away. Thank you for the purification, Hashem, I went home happy. Happy, I was really happy. I had a huge smile on my face. So you see that when you just see Hashem Itbarach in all of those situations, you couldn't care less. So, okay, he's cursing me. It, it doesn't hurt me that he's cursing me. It's going to hurt my arrogance if I would have it to fight with him, to be insulted. Hey, who you think you are? What are you talking? The person had two different shoes. He had mm -hmm. weird pants. He, no, it was not sane. Poor person. Cursing you in Shabbat morning because you're a bad Shubha Hasid Brestev that is not ready to sell his son's bar mitzvah to fill in. <laughs> okay. You need to understand that the Torah is teaching us how to achieve our potential, how to become to be who that you are. And then when you come to that point that you understand that you are, that you have something precious inside of you, that you have something unique, that you have your soul, then you're not open to discussions anymore. Rabbeinu is bringing in Sipurei Maasiyot, that when the Viceroy, he went to look for the lost princess, and he's going, and he met three huge righteous people. And to describe those huge righteous people, Rabbeinu is telling us enormous things about them. 
He's saying that they had the power to control all of the animals, all of the birds, all of the spirits of the universe. We're talking about righteous people that are tzaddiki sadolam, they're the foundation of the world. They were carrying a huge tree on their back. Tree, it's a tree of life. It, we're talking about giants. And Rabbeinu is saying that they were giants. And all of those three huge righteous people that are establishing the creation, they are foundations of the world for sure. And they're looking at him, at that poor Baal Tshuva, and they're telling him, you're dreaming. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen to you. It's not exist. We know that it's not exist. What is not exist? Geula berachamim. Redemption with kindness. On that they're talking, it's not exist. Listen, Am Israel are not able. Am Israel are sinning. Am Israel are dancing in gay clubs. Am Israel are doing drugs, hard drugs, cocaine. Am Israel are, 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 are doing everything that you, you don't know. You can never imagine. I tell them, no, you can't imagine. I can. And with the greatest righteous people, I'm telling you that I was sitting with huge righteous people that you would be scared to talk because I was also scared to talk. But when I came to my truth and I realized that that's the truth, that Hashem opened my eyes to see that truth, I wasn't scared anymore to say it. And I couldn't care less anymore what they're going to tell me. Even if they're going to tell me no, I'm going to tell them yes, I'm sorry. I will apologize with all due respect to this rabbi, to that rabbi, to that enormous study, with all due respect. You don't understand what you're talking about if you're talking about something that you don't know. If you never question yourself, maybe I should be gay, maybe I shouldn't be gay. If you, that thought never crossed your mind, so you don't know what gays are all about. You don't know. You can tell me, no, look, no. If it haven't came into your mind to question your manhood, so you, never, you can never understand what it means to be gay. You can never understand what it means. If you never felt crazy thoughts of despair, of sadness, of wild... Uh, um, um, uh, 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 of daniot. Suicidal thoughts. Suicidal thoughts, you cannot understand what's coming in the mind of a person that he thinks to kill himself today, to take his life in his hand. You can never understand what it means because you've never been there. You cannot be wiser than a person with experience. Experience in hell, yes. If you want to have the wisdom of how to deal with hell, and with hell we need to deal today. Because Rabbeinu called this world hell. He said, heaven, we believe that exists. This world, I never found it. And hell, that's what we feel that it is. So we're probably in hell. That's what Rabbeinu said. We're in hell here. You want to save souls. Where are they? They're at hell. They're at hell. You need to go straight to hell and to redeem them and to talk to them, and to go out. Talk them out from hell. You talk to people, they look to you like decent people. You start hearing a little bit from their life stories, you realize they're in hell. People are destroying themselves. People are destroying themselves, running and chasing after lusts and desires and after the frustration. So far from faith, so far from finding the Creator. But in a minute, the Creator can change it all. He can just switch their life to a different place in a moment, in a day, like that he did with mine. So when you, Yagata or Matsata Tamin, you put an effort in your life, then believe in yourself. If you put an effort and then you found something, believe. Believe yourself, believe in yourself, believe to what that you found. Now I don't listen to no one anymore. I don't need to listen to no one because I know exactly what Hashem wants from me. I don't need to listen to no one that's going to tell me, no, yes, yes no, yes. I, 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 I went through all of that clarification already. I know what the will of Hashem Barach is already. Someone asked me, are you a student of Rav Shalom? I told him yes. He said, okay, when you have questions, are you going to ask him? I told him no. He said, but so, oh, but you said he's your rabbi? I told him yes, he, he's my rabbi. He said, okay, so what do you do when you have questions? I told him I'm a Baal Tshuva. So he said, I don't understand. A Baal Tshuva, so you have a lot of questions probably. As a Baal Tshuva, you don't know everything. So I told him, no, no, no. You don't understand what it means a Baal Tshuva. 
A Baal Tshuva is a person that he owns the answer. I can answer all of your questions. I don't need to go to ask my rabbi. I can answer all of your questions. He is my rabbi. I don't go to ask him none of my questions anymore because I own the answer. Because I already asked him everything I had to ask. Because 12 years of my life I was running after him like a madman, like a crazy person. Like Elisha was running after Eliyahu Anavi. And after I finished knowing and understanding everything, I felt the sorrow of Nesira that Hashem Barach just was uh, cutting between us and separating us and making me to be planted in a different field now. And it just took me as a branch from Rav Shalom and planted me in a different field. And that's exactly what it's written in Likutem Moran, that the righteous man, the Tzadik Kubala Sadeh, he owns the field. And he knows exactly when to separate between the trees and how to make certain distance that they won't going to deny each other, that they will not going to destroy and bother and hurt each other. And when Hashem Barach realized that, and when Rabbeinu HaKadosh realized that, when I went to the Bial Rebbe to ask him some questions, I went there, I said to myself, you need to get some chizuk. Before I was waiting in line over there, I took out the book of Zohar HaKadosh, and the Zohar HaKadosh, Tikkun HaZohar, I think it was, and I opened Tikkun HaZohar, and it's written over there that sometimes you need to cut a branch from the tree, and you take it, and you plant it in a different field, and it grows, and it brings down roots. It was enough of a chizuk for me. Then when I spoke to the Bial Rebbe, I had only some, some uh, fine details that I needed to, 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 to tips that I needed to finish. But it wasn't the issue. I, the issue, Hashem just told me the issue. The issue was that I've been cut from that tree and now I'm already having my own new roots in the ground. So for people that cannot understand it, you know why they cannot understand it? Because they don't believe in themselves that they can manage Without a Rav. What are you going to do without a Rav? But what? Now you're not with a Rav. You may be not with a Rav. You may be feel that if you're not going to be in his yeshiva, you're not going to be with him. But me, I'm in a different place already. When Rav Shalom told me in one of the days, you are connected to me through the heart, with, from the heart, Atar Mechubar Elai Balev, I felt that. And from that day and on, that's the truth. I also said it to Rav Shalom, by the way. That from that day and on, I felt like our physical connection, relationship, was not needed for me anymore. And it was after 12 years of me holding his hand, holding his tzitziot, that when I need to go to doctor, to, to hospital, in emergency situation, I'm not going to go to hospital, I'm going to go to Rav Shalom first. That when I'm not sleeping, I'm going to go to, to see him in the middle of the night to ask him if I have questions. One time he came back from a class at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night and he sees me doing it badadut in front of his house. And it was hard for him because he was tired, he wanted to go to sleep. So he told me, what are you doing here? So I told him, I'm doing it badadut. So he answered to me, he said, I thought that it was badadut you should do in the field. Hard answer, right? A hard answer in the middle of the night after two hours of expecting him to come already. So I told him, I thought that in front of the house of Baal Asadeh, of the one that owns the field, there's a field. So he didn't have an answer for that. So he smiled his huge smile and answered to all of my questions with a smile. <laughs> So when you have Seat Adishmai, one time I came to his house in the noontime, just after Yeshiva, I went back, I took the kids home, and then I ran back to his house, I had something to ask, I came, I just burst into the house, I saw him, he looked at me, he told me, you have Seat Adishmai. So I told him, what Arab needs? He said, I need someone to take me to the field. Can you do that? He was busy in the last 15 minutes of making phone calls to see how, who can help him to take him to the field, whatever. No one could help him and he had to go to the field. And I just came to take him to the field. So I took him, we spoke and everything. So I gave my time already. I, I already achieved it. And like that he himself told me, 
The Mishnah is saying that a person cannot understand his rabbi until 40 years. You achieved it much, much faster. That's what he told me. It was after 12 years. In the first or second years that I knew Rav Shalom, I told him one time about my difficulties. He told me even Yosef HaTzadik had to stay 12 years in the pit, in jail. You're going to have to give your 12 years. Those are words of Rav Shalom. In the first year that I met him, second year that I met him, he told me you're going to have to give your time. You're going to have to sit for your 12 years. There was a person in the yeshiva over there that he was always asking me, how many years do you still, do you still have? How many, st how many years do you still have? After 12 years, I was out. There was nothing you could do. I was already out. It took me time to understand it, but I was out. But I was out to go. I was out to grow. I was out because I really took from him that point of to believe in myself and to understand what is my destiny and what is my job. And every one of you need to find that wisdom inside of himself. Who am I? What's my mission in the world? How am I going to become to be who that I am? Hashem wants to give it to you. Hashem wants to hand it to you. Hashem doesn't want you to be a puppet, doesn't want you to imitate, not me and not him. He doesn't want you to be from those Hasidim that are behaving and acting like the rabbi. And, 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 and We're not robots. We're not droids. We're normal people. You should find your unique light, your specialty in what Hashem Itbar gifted you, what Hashem Itbar gave you. You have things inside of yourself. You don't need no money, you don't need no beauty, you don't need no talents. You have your treasures inside of you, you just need to be aware to them. You don't know what you do, you don't know what you, you achieve, you don't know what happens when you say brachot. Even if you have desire for food and you eat like crazy, you don't know why. Ask Hashem why. Ask Hashem why. Why? What it means that I'm eating so much? What it means that I'm sleeping so much? What it means that I'm talking so much? What it means? What it means that I, I watch Jim Carrey videos all of the time? What does it mean? What, who am I, Hashem? What does it mean? Who am I in all of that? What is the Jewish spark of all of that? And if you're going to be brave enough to look for the truth, you're going to find it. And then you're going to understand that you do have a purpose over there that you can achieve big things over there. Even though that it's a weird zone, it's twilight zone, it's dark, and it's about uh, what's going on here? People are falling like flies. People are falling like flies. And you need to attach yourself, you need to understand. If there's a fruit, that fruit got a peel. So, if there's a rabbi, and you want to attach yourself to him, so for you, he is the fruit. Great, so you made yourself to be his peel. Okay, so it's a problematic place to hold. You don't want that. So there are layers also in the peel. There are layers that when you peel the peel, when you take it off, they're still attached to the fruit. And they're edible. And they're joining the fruit. And when you're going to say, Bore Peria Etz on that fruit, you're going to take that part of the peel with it. And you included yourself in the fruit. Even that you're external, even that you're coming from outside, it all depends on the amount of love. It all depends on the amount of love that you have to your teacher, to your rabbi, to the one that you define as a fruit. And then you become to be his essence, you become to be part of the fruit. And when you're big enough and strong enough and you have the power you have to, to, to exist, to hold on, to be who that you are, great. Rabbeinu can take you and plant you in another place and then you're going to start making fruits. And you're going to make fields and fields of, of fruits. Strawberry fields forever. <laughs> yeah, you can be so sweet. <laughs> What can I do? It's written, En Rav Belital Midim. You made me to be a rabbi. It's your fault. And you're going to have to deal with that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you wouldn't come, I wouldn't talk. It's your fault. So you go. Deal with it. Thank you. Chazak <laughs>